This episode is brought to you by the key to fun, Bandai. <laughs> uh, you, you know it's fresh when they've got the sponsor message on. <laughs> Bluey Productions has a few questions. Number one, favorite non-tokusatsu-based inspirations both in and out of YouTube? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So where, where, where do you look for inspo in general outside of toku? Mm, uh, yeah. let's, that, that, that is going to be a tough one. Uh, Bluey, why did you have to throw this one at me? Um, <laughs> And for YouTube, I mean, I think one of my my biggest inspirations is um, Stop Skeletons from Fighting. I love that channel so much, and they're so thorough with their research. I think, honestly, there's a little bit of Top Gear in there, too. Top Gear did, I don't know if it still does, because I stopped watching. Yeah. Um, (laughs) It did have beautiful editing and cinematography. You know, I I think I will say Top Gear, too. for that then because i feel like oh, how top gear is structured and how it's edited like peak top gear like peak revival yes. top gear i yes. think is very very much an influence on me yeah. that's the best way i can really describe it at this point unfortunately i have to really think about that and maybe i'll come back at this at a later date <laughs> more questions from bluey underrated toku that you recommend as an essential to a fan of the genre Ooh, um underrated you know, I'm going to say Message from Space. Message from Space, It a lot of people just think, oh, it's a Star Wars knockoff. It is far from it. There are some brilliant things happening in that movie in terms of like how like effects are being staged and the scope of it. It still holds up. It's still a fun romp of a movie. I find it kind of funny how the way they did their trench run in that movie oddly mirrors what Lucas did with Return of the Jedi with the uh, Death Star reactor chase in that one (laughs) so um but yeah i think message from space deserves a lot more credit in that regard uh another good one that is now recently made available ultra q the movie legend of the stars which also was written off largely because there was a lack of english subtitles for it it's now available it's now out in the world and i'll i'll publicly admit that i contributed to that we commissioned someone to do a, a fan translation I mean, a couple of friends. So I will, gl- mm. I'll, I'll gladly put my name on it. So, nice. So it's out there in the world. It's on my top five list for ultra series movies. It's visually fantastic. Uh, last one from Bluey. Do you have an opinion on the whole Zio discourse and production wackiness? Hot mess of a garbage fire. No, kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Zio is a show that. I wanted to love, but the problem is is they kept hanging lanterns on bad writing and plot holes. It just kept turning me off. And then the designs kept getting busier and busier. Like, yes, they brought Decade in, and I was so happy to see Masahiro in a way again. It was too little, too late for me to care. To me, it just, as a show, fell way too short. And I wish it could have been a much more solid show. I just wish that people... When it came to Ryder, at least, they wouldn't play so fast and loose with, like, time travel and, like, dimension hopping and all that junk. When you set things up and you have specific rules and you keep breaking them and keep coming up with really dumb explanations for breaking them. Stacks. From Dito. How do you think Metal Hero can return? I mean, as an actual return, not just the return of the old suits as new characters like Next Generation and Space Squad. It can't. Oh. Okay, next question. No <laughs> kidding. Uh, I mentioned earlier, Metal Hero is quintessential 1980s. It is the personification. I don't think that with the current climate, with the business models and things like that, it would be able to be unique, as people hope it would be. It would literally just be another common Rider. Because I guarantee mm. you, it would have the exact same collect all gimmick. Because mm. I think someone asked me this on Twitter a while back, and, and I still feel the same way, is that there's... Outside of nostalgia, there's no way you could ever really bring it back without making some really serious compromises that would really question why it happened in the first place. Okay, on to Devon1224, who has a couple of questions. Mm. One, is there a toku series you want a Hollywood adaptation of? 
I can't think of one that I would want to see a Hollywood version of because I just I, I don't like Hollywood right now. Uh, <laughs> I, and I don't trust them with it. A lot of people have been clamoring for like HBO Common Rider. I'm like, you know what would happen oh. if that came out is we would essentially get Westworld. We would get less superhero action and more focus on like the humans and for instance there's the whole arc that lasted all of two episodes in the original Kamen Rider with Ruriko where like she believes that Takashi Hongo killed her father when he clearly didn't this arc lasts maybe all of two episodes and it's finally like oh I I know now you didn't do it there's no way you could have and so I'm like great wonderful the show can progress I guarantee you they would play up that thing for like eight episodes and it would be bad. Yeah, I can't really think of a one that I would want to see because I would just be too scared the whole time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Feel that. Josh Knight the first asks, which property has the best shot at being localized in 2020 and by what company? None of them. None of them. And if it was, it would probably be Hasbro, whether you like it or not. (laughs) (laughs) This will be another one where I do a hard swerve. Uh, I'm going to say that 2020, we're not getting anything. Mm. 2021 or 2022 is going to be the year of Precure, though. Hmm. And it's funny because people try to say, like, oh, well, Precure is Tokusatsu. It's not. (sighs) And it makes no sense (laughs) why people try to do that. Takashi Miki has the the Girls X Heroine series, which is in its fourth season. Something like that. Something like that. So that's... As far as Tokusatsu Precure, it's being done. Yeah. Um, is Glitter Force actually going to start being a thing? Oh, Glitter Force stopped, actually. Oh, what? I was wondering about that because I saw that my, my friends and their daughter were watching Smile Precure, Glitter yeah. Force, and then Glitter Force Doki Doki, which is why a friend of mine asked if Doki Doki Literature Club had anything to do with it. And oh. I had to be like, no. Oh, no. <laughs> And then I heard nothing more about it, so they just stopped. I, from what I heard, the the rights reverted back or something. I don't know. Oh, what a shame. No beef to anybody who worked on the show, especially not the voice actresses. Oh, because they did a good job on that show, though. The, The voice actresses did a fantastic job. It's just, starting with Smile, I mean, that was the one that had the giant robot parody episode with key animation by Masami Obari. (laughs) And they just kind of fluffed over that one and i was like okay if you're not gonna play i don't know what to tell you ah really from what i understand the thing is i get it like the things it parodied are not as big over here to little kids but there are plenty of robot shows that are Uh, and you could (laughs) you could fudge you could fudge it or the main reason i'm saying that precure probably might might happen every time lately that toei's twitter channel mentions Anything related to Precure, everybody jumps on them. Mm-hmm. Everybody jumps on them like, oh, this is great and wonderful, but for the love of God, give us the HD remaster of Futari. Uh-huh. Or simulcast uh, Healing Good, goddammit, which I'm surprised they haven't. If they would do what Tamashi Nations is doing with uh, Wataru, I think that they would get a much better a much better response than they think. We had the 15th anniversary. Yeah. We had the big thing. It's time. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is very time. Yeah. Alex, aka Ajax Ranger. What series slash movie do you feel had the most potential to be brilliant, but somehow ended up missing the mark? Ultraman, uh, the ultimate hero. <laughs> <laughs> For those playing at home, that's the time that Subarai thought that they could just throw an Ultraman show at Hollywood and it would just congeal into something epic. And the problem is it didn't because the people making the show, their hearts were in the right place, but Mm. they kept making the wrong decisions. So there are things about Powered that I love. I love Powered Balton. I love that Jamila looks like an actual spacesuit. But the problem is that the miniatures for the first episodes are so bad that Tsuburaya had to send model makers from Japan to the States to work on it. So that's why, like, the miniatures from, I think, like, episode four, episode five onward, like, very early on, it's, like, the first four or five episodes. But from that point on, the miniatures are pretty good. But they still treat them terribly because there's literally an episode where Ultraman gets thrown into, like, a pack of buildings and you can see the hollowed out bottoms. And- oh. 
It's it, it's not great. And they made the suits super brittle. I don't know what material they used for them, but they, the suits were so brittle that they kept breaking. So anytime there's an actual fight, it's like two porcelain dolls sumo wrestling. Oh no. It's really bad. And everything else up to like the actual monster fights is pretty good. Like the winner team is okay. The mecha designs are good. Orchestral score is really good. It's just everything that should be in an Ultraman show that completely just doesn't end well. Honorable mention for this goes to Kamen Rider Wizard, which is the visual equivalent <laughs> of a, a really good speech being spoken at a assembly where the dude suddenly drops his cards midway through and frantically tries to reassemble them to finish. Oh, dear. Yeah, so. I just realized I watched 50% of Wizard. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I had forgot, you know, I had forgotten that it existed. <laughs> And then you mention it, and I'm like, that sounds so familiar. And then it all started coming back, starting with the theme song. And then it's like, oh, oh, ah. Okay, yeah. (laughs) I remember it now. When a show comes back to you in stages over the course of 10 seconds, and you're like, oh, right. It's like abort mission, abort, abort. (laughs) No, memory. No, 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 no. Uh, XYZZY Squirrel asks, in the show A Common Rider video, you mention curating the first Common Rider so all 98 episodes don't erode your will to watch. Mm. What would you call, what's your recommended watch list for that first series? Um, how I do shows like that that go on for a while is I tend to look at like the episode synopsis. Like if it's a really fun title, I'll go for it. That's honestly what got me through Wind Spectre. Because <laughs> there are times, <laughs> uh, like Wind Spectre and Soul Brain, because there are times I would watch that and I would be like, okay, I'm going to call it a night. Wait, what? Giant bird? What? And I would just, <laughs> when it comes to a show like um, like Common Rider or like Go Ranger or Mazinger Z even, kind of have to look at it as, okay, what are the fights that I want to watch? What are the, the moments that I want to watch? There's a lot of filler very early on in, in um, uh, Hayato's initial episodes so like that's i think a good starting point although i would not skip the episode with the uh, luchador wrestler i would never skip anything with a luchador wrestler another good point is to kind of look for like the major story moments villain changes and first appearances of characters the one thing that i will say is that if you're expecting grand exits for a lot of the writer girls you're not going to get it the show cycles them out like bond girls without any pomp or ceremony it's kind of a bummer or like Ah. goro just he just vanishes from the show and that's it he's gone who is, like, the best kid of any, like, uh, tokusatsu show ever, I think, because he's just a little quippy little badass and pretty funny. (laughs) You have to do a little bit of digging into, like, okay, like, there's an episode that was directed by Shitaru Shinomori, you know, you know, there's the first episode of Gel Shocker, and then you have the Christmas episode, which you can never skip. You cannot (laughs) skip it. It is not Christmas until Colonel Zol gets Ryder punched in the face. Basically, go off of your own preferences and just have a good time. Yeah. And if you do it and there's an episode that doesn't work out, then you have like 97 plus episodes, whatever to choose from still. <laughs> Next question from TokuFan75. It's the rarest tokusatsu item you have. Oh, rarest item. Um, I mean, I have an autograph from uh, Ichiro Mizuki by my door. So I think that's one <gasps> thing. Yeah. That's so like, cool. Yeah, uh, I think it's that and uh, the, the bit of tablecloth that uh, Hiroshi Watari signed <laughs> <laughs> that I have outside my, uh, on my door. I've had that ever since I got it. Uh, that was a present from August Ragone. So I have that on my, my door to my room. And like the Ichiro Mizuki autograph is parallel to it as I walk in. Ah. Yeah, that was a present from Patrick Macias because he got to interview him and then he got it for me. Ah, uh, TV's Patrick Macias. Good old TV's Patrick Macias. <laughs> yes. I haven't seen him in a while. I've seen him on social, but not in person in like ages. Yes. Follow up from Toku Fan uh, Collection Tour? Question mark? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> Cancel that noise. No. You have to understand. Okay, there's the book collection, there's the bag of henshin items that's under my bed. <laughs> and then there's the 10 plus years of toys that are in oh, the no. attic and gashapons and books and magazines that I still have to sort through and I'm trying to refurbish. So oh, geez. the only way I would ever do that is if I was moving out or I reached a crazy Patreon milestone. Because like... Oh, t- 
Pop yeah. that up. Oh, no, I, I don't want to invite that. Uh, Red Letter Media did their thing where they rattled off their entire VHS collection. And I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> uh... So tell you what, I'll, I'll think about it. I'll think about it, but no promises. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, too, have a bag of henshin items under my bed. Mine are all Magical Girl ones, though, so slight difference. Oh, yeah, don't you have the Kabuto Zector, though? Yo, shoot, that's right, I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, you gave me that. That was good. That was that was, that was back in the before times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> before the dark oh times, God. before the empire. <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot I had that, and I have, oh, I have some Hurricane stuff, too. Oh, that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, I have so much Hurricane Ranger stuff. Oh my, yeah, that's right, because we, yeah, we met, because the Gal Ranger fan dub, there was also the Hurricane Ranger fan dub that we did, too. Yeah, oh, fan dub times. Uh, oh, yeah, so, <laughs> Secret Origins being injected in here. Fan dubs are how I know Christina V, and so it's really weird to uh, to be working along on stuff, and I'm over here on Crunchyroll writing news, and like, blah, 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 Christina V in a new dub, I'm like, this is so surreal. <laughs> She she and I used to do like Sailor Moon clips together and now she's like actually doing this and I'm like actually working in the industry and it's like 20 year old me would be so freaked. Yeah. But questions, plural, from Chuodori. Oh. Uh, number one. What was it about Tokusatsu and Super Sentai that initially drew your interest? To summarize it in one sentence, Godzilla flying dropkick. <laughs> Fair. It mostly started because I, I caught Godzilla versus Megalon on like a UHF station. And it was like the last five minutes and it was like the craziest thing I had ever seen. And I just, I oh. wanted more of it healing. And then I think also what helped the journey was that, because I literally discovered Super Sentai because of Sentai Magazine by Antarctic Press way back when. But also- Oh gosh, yeah. Yeah, but also because I walked in on an episode of Die Ranger at our local anime store mm. and it there's a guy dying in that. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> a dude takes a missile punch to the chest and he's bleeding? <laughs> Not kid stuff. <laughs> yeah. That was uh, peak uh, Chunibyo Mike Dent right there. Oh, my God. Let, <laughs> let's, not, let, let's, not talk, let, let's not talk of the dark times. We're going to have to just have, like, a, a whole separate, like, Chuni admissions podcast. No. That's going to be way – that's going to be behind, like, a really high uh, milestone. <laughs> yeah. Chuni <laughs> confessions. <laughs> Chuni confessions. Question two. If you could get to ask one question to one Toku or Sentai cast member or production staff member, alive or dead, who would it be? What would you ask? Uh, I would just want an hour with Hideaki Anno. When you say you want an hour with Anno, do you mean interview or like to scrap? It's like, you want to go, <laughs> mate? You want to go? <laughs> Not so. No, I, um, no, I would just want to be like... Hey, dude, so Return of Ultraman, though, and I just want to see him just <laughs> clear the table and, <laughs> just, and we just nerd out for like an hour. Um, ah, that but would be fun. It, if I really wanted to meet someone, I think it would be uh, Shozo Izuka. Shozo Izuka is a voice actor. He's been in a lot of Super Robot stuff. He's also been in a lot of Tokusatsu stuff. Very versatile dude. Like, you'll know him when you hear him. I think he would be on the list for sure of just like people I'd want to pick his brain just as a voice actor. He's still around. I think though, if we kind of want to talk about someone who's dead, uh, Machiko Soga. Mm. Machiko Soga, who played uh, Bandora and Jew Ranger and. <gasps> oh, yeah. And, yeah. Pandora and Spielbon and, and, and Queen Hidorian and Denji Man and Sun Vulcan. Like, that would be another brain pick, and I would probably just want to hug. Shower her with adoration. <laughs> exactly. It's like you are Tokusatsu grandma, and I'm here for this. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, by the way, for anyone uh, who has not seen it, if you can in any way see uh, Aoi Hono. Yes. Uh, Blue Blazes or Blue Fire, speaking of Return of Ultraman. Their depiction of Anno is just on point. Mm. One, it's also just a great look at the formation of Gainax. Right. It's, it is it is like the less glorified otaku no video, essentially. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, Mega Sun Pika 125 or 126, depending on whether you look at his yeah. handle or username. name. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on your upgrade, question mark. Uh asks we have power rangers and people always ask about common rider coming to america but my question is what do you think could be done if there was ever a modern ultraman adaptation oh if well i mean we're gonna get that with shin ultraman so that'll be interesting to see how that pads out but I, oh yeah um but if we get something in america there's one of two ways it could go one is they go full cg and we get like a, a troll hunters type thing where the designs are kind of dumbed down, but it's like full CG. Or we get full on drama. And 
I just feel like if they brought it out, they would kind of miss the point. If they did a modern adaptation, I would just want it to be like, do it like an anthology show. Because that's where it's at its strongest. Like Ultraman Max works as a great entry point show because it's anthology. If it was me and I was doing it, I would structure it like the big O. Mm. Okay. Like the first season of the Big O before season two kicked in ruined everything. Uh, because <laughs> season one of the Big O was fantastic. They went to a bunch of people and said, "You have this big sandbox to play with. You can advance the mystery a little bit, or you can just do whatever the hell you want." And so suddenly we have giant mutant plants, or we have <laughs> ghosts, or stuff like that, and different robots. And I think an Ultraman show would thrive if you came up with a really distinct sandbox and said this is a world with monsters and aliens or maybe that we're coexisting with the monsters and you can do this this is and this and also maybe get Guillermo del Toro to like direct an episode but Ooh. um that would be my dream although um the other end of the spectrum would be <laughs> something a uh Japanese uh, Twitter buddy of mine brought up because we were talking about you know, Guillermo del Toro doing Ultraman, and he had mentioned, you know, it'd be kind of cool to see, like, Ultraman in the Mountains of Madness. And I'm like... Oh, jeez. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, oh, I need it. So if if I, if I had the power, I would totally just do that and get Mike Mignola or whatever and just be like, it's the science patrol in a type of, like, gothic horror setting. But, like, you take <sighs> you take some liberties with things, and you do, like, a, almost like a kind of a reimagining. So I would love to make that happen. I may just do it same day with the uh, serial numbers filed off. Mm. Mignola's Ultraman uh, sketches. So many of them, I remember, uh, were just like, all I remember is the toy. I'm not sure what this dude's deal is, but here's my take on it. Yeah. And... Oh, they were so cool. Someone called him out for being a liar about that because, like, I guess he had done stuff before. But <laughs> whatever, well, whatever. Well, yeah, because like, you're, like you're totally a fan, you bastard. Just own up to it. Uh, or, <laughs> or some, not that drastic. We, we but... <laughs> all we all admit things in our own time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but uh, who knows? Yeah. They were they were cool pictures. They were either way. Brawl Kaiser has some questions. The first one you've already answered, which was what got you into Tokusatsu and Super Robot. We have your origin story. Yeah. Favorite mecha series? Oh, no. I know. I know, right? <laughs> uh, I know. I, I think it's going to be, you know, I'm going to say just the Getter Robo franchise in general. Is that's what, fair. That's it's what I keep coming back to. It, it kills me just the whiplash that happens with Getter Robo because it starts yeah. out as giant robots fighting dinosaurs and then suddenly <laughs> it's a cosmic horror story. Yep. Because <laughs> actually Getter Robo I think was the first 1970s super robot show I watched. I got that tape at Gen Con. The vendor he had a Soul Chagokin Mazinger Z and I was begging my mom to get it for me. Oh, and sounds so cool. This is right when it came out. What ended up happening is I conceded and I ended up buying, uh, or she ended up getting me uh, Get a Robo G Volume 1. On, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so I, I have that tape still. Back then, a bunch of my friends were like, oh, this is so uncool, whatever. But then now most of those friends are now into super robots. And Well, well yeah. And, and one of them had a hard, <laughs> a hard realization that it's like, Oh my god, that moment when you realize that the reason you've listened to such good music is because Mock Dent has shown it to you. And I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so I swear I don't have an ego. I swear. <laughs> so... Oh my god. Uh last question from Brawl Kaiser. The most important question as far as I'm concerned. Most huggable mech. Robocon. Fair. Neo Roni asks. How do you feel about the rise of gimmick collectible items throughout the 2000s, but mostly the 2010s, since that's when it went full force? Ah, uh, you know, granted, I'm just like a voice actor and a writer. I haven't done anything like substantial yet. So I, I only have so much ground to stand on. But I was going to say, most people here have not won an Emmy. It's okay. Right, right, right. But when I think about that, and I think about the writer's room, and I think about like the stuff you're having to deal with, it puts these shows in a different kind of peril that I don't think they need to be in. So, like, for instance, anytime I hear that there's a new writer working on a show, I immediately panic in the back of my head and immediately scramble to find their credits. And <laughs> that is where I judge. And if it's a tokusatsu show, I look at, like, if it's toyetic and how they handled it. I look at something like Kamen Rider Drive, where every episode they had to push the damn Hot Wheels and the show tanked. 
so hard that they had to do a soft reboot midway through. I hate that Ultraman has to do it now to kind of play the game. And I'm glad that for the most part, they've been able to still turn out like really good shows. Taiga was pretty good. From what I was able to see at Taiga, like it, it turned out pretty good, even though they had to keep pushing the, the upgrades and the, and the bracelets and all that stuff like that. But it wasn't mm-hmm. like beating you over the head with it. And I'm also glad we graduated from the Spark Dolls because we... Ugh. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy for soft vinyl toys, but like when you had Ultraman X integrate that into the the transformation item, I uh, I get they had to do it, but I still hated it. Like, <laughs> um, I, I really do. But um, yeah, I just feel like it's very cumbersome, and I I hate the model. I hate that it's it's what the way it is, and and that's become like this this monolith of a machine. That nobody mm-hmm. seems to want to, like, stop and fix. Uh, speaking of toys, Zither wants to know, what is, in your opinion, the worst tokusatsu toy ever made? Flash Titan. <laughs> 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 Flash. Goddamn Titan. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh. But for those playing at home, Flash Titan is a truck. So you have the front truck that comes up, and then it folds up. And, like, the, the, the front engine part kind of folds and becomes the stomach, and then it, he has arms and legs. And you're like, okay, that looks fine. That looks fine. And the suit looks okay. But then he turns into Great Titan. And all Great Titan is is the trailer popped up with two little tiny arms. And fla- I'm looking at him right now. And Flash Titan just popping into the back and slotting into the, the football helmet-like head. And it gets worse when you watch the actual show because the model is hideous. It is <laughs> it is the most hideous thing I've ever seen. And I think what makes it worse for me is that Flashman had one of the best designed robots. Flash King is so good. And then you go from that to that clunky mess. I feel like such a downgrade. It happens again in Mask Man, where you have like Great Five, which is this really cool combination of five vehicles, and then you go to Galaxy Robo, which just looks terrible and just really gaudy like color scheme. But I would take Galaxy Robo any day of the week over a fucking Flash Titan. The trailer of the Flash Titan truck looks like someone just cut a chunk off a Star Wars ride. Pretty much. It's <laughs> it's un- I don't even. That's uh, it is an area of unfamiliarity to me, but I'm like, oh boy, I hate it. It's 80s, but not like an 80s toy. <laughs> it's 80s like 80s architecture. Pretty much. And I think that's why it's weirding me out. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look. It doesn't look like a, a a thing that's supposed to be mobile. It looks like it goes in a theme park, and I am closing the tab. <laughs> Yeah, and in show, all it does is moves his arms up, and that's it. It just right. towers over the monster of the week with a composite. And I'm like, <laughs> what's to stop the monster of the week to just ramming into it and pushing it over? Because <laughs> that's all it would take. Some Flash Titan stand's going to show up outside my window tonight. Yeah, well, they've been coming for me for years, but they still can't find me. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Monstrosity's Tokusatsu oh, hey. asks, favorite and least favorite kaiju movie? Ah, okay. Uh, favorite kaiju movie, uh, Gamera 3, Revenge Virus. Ooh. It is a goddamn tokusatsu textbook. I encourage anyone who's wanting to see the perfect blend of digital and practical effects to watch that movie. But see, least favorite kaiju movie. Um, oh, God. I got to really think about this one. Because, like, <laughs> well, there's a lot of stinkers of Godzilla movies that I don't like. Shoot. Because even, like, the worst ones I have a good time with, too. But I can't think of one that I have a is like, this is terrible, abort mission. No, what am I thinking? Godzilla 2014. <laughs> <laughs> that was a journey. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, oh, I paid to see that. I remember being so excited and then like you find out that the trailers lied to us. They kill off the best character. I was so mad at Minimal Cranston. The character that we got stuck with was a a wooden crate of a person uh, uh, yeah. and super uninteresting. And they slapped on the my family factor to try to get us to care about him. And it didn't work. And then they kept like teasing Godzilla. And people were like, well, that's every Godzilla movie. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> and if it is, it does it better. Okay. I've got a few questions from Kyo Katarino. Uh, number one. What are your thoughts on the Hosoda era of Sentai? 
I was kind of weirded out by that question. I was like, wait a minute, Soda era? And then I looked it up and I'm like, oh, he meant Hirohisa Soda. Oh. Soda has been a writer for Super Sentai ever since the time of Go Ranger, but he became the main writer for um, a lot of shows starting with Goggle 5. And then I believe going all the way to Five Man, but he stopped writing for Sentai uh, altogether with Car Ranger. I think that era shines its best when there's clear objective. For instance, Flashman works so well. You have these five kids who were abducted by aliens who were on Earth to try and save it, but also try to find their families. And there's also like a little bit of them being ostracized because they're aliens technically now. I think it's great, except for... Flash Titan. You know, that that's not his fault. And also Live Man, which I think Live Man is like my favorite Sentai show of all time, or one of my favorites. It's in my top three. And that's a show that really gave you compelling villains. It made them sympathetic in a way that I don't think a lot of other shows at the time were really doing, apart from like Starscream levels of intrigue. And I think he does well when he has a great staff behind him. Like he had like peak Toshiki Inoue working with him pre-Jetman to Shiki Inoue, so he's still, like, pretty good and not throwing people into lakes. <laughs> but then you have Dynaman and Goggle 5, which, like, both kind of bleed together. There's, like, this period of Sentai from, like, I want to say from Denji Man to Dynaman, where it all kind of bleeds together. There's some interesting story beats that happen, but it's not, like, be-all, end-all. It's still fluff. It's still a good time, but it's not, like, substantial. So if you're wanting to go for, like, a deeper storyline, you're not going to find those within that era. But, the, like, those later shows in that run are just masterpieces in their own right. Like, even Bioman, where you find out that Red One can talk to animals as a result <laughs> of his new superpowers. Like, that, to me, like, that is still a good time. I still love it. <laughs> also, we got one of the best wild card villains of all time with uh, Silva. Dude shows up and he's so powerful that even the villains are afraid of him. And they <laughs> and they try to manipulate him. He's after the heroes because he is a robot designed to destroy bioparticles and that's what the heroes uh, use like for their superpowers. So like he's like bioparticles detected and he might as well be saying exterminate exterminate. <laughs> <laughs> And he's basically Redeco Hakaider, and I love him. And the cool thing is the villains, like, he doesn't give a damn. He just wants to destroy bioparticles and get his super robot back that if he gets it back, that's it. Everyone's dead. And I love that. It, it just completely shook up the entire series. There's a reason that whole era is revered. And, you know, when you look at those shows, it's so easy to understand why. Their next question. What is your opinion on the current MonsterVerse from Legendary? I just wanted to stick the landing so much. I really wanted to be able to stick the landing because like 2014 Godzilla was not great. Kong Skull Island was fantastic. Godzilla King of the Monsters visually was amazing, but that goddamn family subplot needed to go because it was so dumb. <laughs> What's her name? Uh, who played the daughter? Stranger Things girl? Stranger Things girl, yeah. We'll refer to her Millie as Bobby it. Brown. She was criminally underutilized. I feel like they just brought her in to bring in the Netflix crowd. That's like my tinfoil hat conspiracy theory <laughs> for that. <laughs> it's not terribly tinfoil. It sound, sounds on the level. In general, I just remember being like kind of middle of the road about it, but still being mostly satisfied. So I hope that Godzilla vs. Kong, which now, as of this recording, got delayed to next year. I forget when next year. Got, but, uh, I'll probably flash it on screen as a, as a cold reminder of my lack of knowledge. <laughs> George J. Horvath asks, what are your feelings on when Toku gets mixed with other styles of productions like how the live-action adaptations of Fuma no Kojiro and Team Astro mix toku with J-drama elements. Oh, I've been looking forward to this question. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. I haven't seen Team Astro, and I probably should. Fuma no Kojiro is interesting because, like, I didn't really see it as having, like, tokusatsu elements in so much that I think maybe there were a couple of actors and, and like, some mild special effects. I just remember that bit in the opening where they're trying to have a dramatic battle underwater during a swim meet. And... <laughs> And I just, I can't take it seriously. If I remember correctly, it's from the same author as Saint Seiya. So, ah. so I'm like, that explains a lot. If you have a J-drama that kind of dips into the well, it's like, you gotta go all in. And there are examples of it done right, like Aoi Hono, you know, Blue Blazes, like that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I feel, I mean, that counts because, you know, Ultraman or Tokusatsu Ga 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 did it a, a fantastic job doing the balancing act and really doing compelling characters, but also being like, okay, this is what we're all rallying over. And it becomes this great kind of outcast story. I mean, to an extent, Keitai Sosakon 7 kind of counts. 
it was a show directed by Takashi Miike, and it's like good luck trying to find it on uh, uh, on a DVD now. But it was really funny, and it was like a procedural crime drama to an extent. You had like these little cell phones that would turn into little superheroes and fight. But yeah. <gasps> Oh, no, wait. Uh, the hero in Yoshihiko, i got to give that a shout-out or else I'm going to get punched in the face by a friend, which is another <laughs> good example. But you have some examples where it does go wrong. Monster Magnitude 9. I am so bummed out about this. Like, even while talking about it, I, I just, I really, ugh, it's just, it's such a downer. Because Monster Magnitude 9 was a series of novels that essentially was, what if the Science Patrol from Ultraman, but their Special Vehicles Division 2 hmm. from Pat Labor. The book is really good. I highly recommend tracking it down. And so when they announced it during a live action version, I got really excited. I watched it and they essentially cock teased monsters for the entire series, apart from showing like maybe like a a hand smashing into a building or something yeah. like that, or like an egg that they're trying to rescue. Only to have the final episode be two puppet warp silhouettes against a sunrise fighting <sighs> and the battle ends in like five seconds. Aww. I was so bummed out because that the moment that that was adapting is so much better in the book. And I don't want to spoil it. You can still get it as an ebook. I don't know if it's still in print. But then there was also Kaiju Club, which was like three episodes of the same formula, which is, oh no, my girlfriend's going to find out I'm a geek. What do I do? <sighs> and then how he handles it is, hey, this reminds me of this episode of a show that I am reviewing for our fanzine. And, oh my. And this is the moral of the episode, and my girlfriend puts up with me. And it went for three episodes, and I think it needed six. Hmm. The only gimmick of the show was there are kaiju in the flashbacks in, like, vision sequences. And that's it. Hmm. It's just a, a weird show that I think could have been a heck of a lot better if, like, they had actually, you know, given it a plot. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Noguchi has a couple of questions. Oh, yeah. One of them you've kind of answered multiple times yeah <laughs> um, that's cool his other question uh are there toku shows outside japan that we should be looking out for mm. so non uh, uh outside of japan created toku i'm gonna actually throw it out to uh thunderbirds because mm. there is the recent series thunderbirds or go and, that's right and so it's a combination of cg and miniatures Jerry Anderson's influence on Japanese pop culture is, I would have to do a whole essay on that because the influences stretch out. I mean, Eiji Tsuburaya got influenced from him. Gona Guy was influenced by Thunderbirds. There is still like Thunderbirds merchandise being pushed to this day. All three seasons are on Amazon Prime, so I would totally recommend cool. that. And then barring that, Century 21 Films is doing a new Super Marionation TV series in isolation called uh, Nebula 75. If you go to Century 21 Films on YouTube, they're still hosting them. It's a really funny show. I was surprised is not the right word, delighted to find out just how influential Thunderbirds was in Japan. Oh, yeah. Uh, I remember when I was watching uh, Didn't I Say to Make My Abilities Average in the Next Life. Oh, yeah, that's right. And they did an extended Thunderbirds parody. (laughs) And... People were like, why? And it's like, because. <laughs> it's like, do you not know the power and fury that is Thunderbirds in Japan? That is one way I actually got people onto Average Abilities was, there's a Thunderbirds parody. <laughs> um, That was such a good show. God. That was a very good show. They uh, they covered so much stuff. They had they had plenty of Super Sentai in there like, yeah. from, from the word go. Yeah. And even if you don't like Isekai, it feels more like Slayers. It really does. One way I've described it is it doesn't feel like Isekai so much as it feels like a goofy kick the doors down D&D campaign where the DM has given one character license to play an Isekai character. Oh, God, it totally is. That's how it it does not feel like that kind of thing. So (laughs) we have one final set of questions. Oh, no. And I know the order I'm going to read them in. Oh, no. It's not the order they're listed. So these are from Twitter user at Kawaii Mess. God damn it, Tofu. (laughs) Tofu is one of my uh, best uh, fandom buddies. Uh, She's also my enforcer groupie. And (laughs) oh, well, this is this makes it all the better. So I am going to read them in ascending order because 
I know the pacing that will be the best for this. <laughs> Damn it! Uh, <laughs> okay. So first up, what's your favorite practical special effect? Um, strobe explosions. Mm. Like the flashes as like the building is going down. Like I love that effect. Or when a monster gets hit and they're about to just go up in flames. You see this short little barrage of flash bulbs go off and then the explosion. Mm. I always love that. Mm. Like when they did that in Gridman, I I lost my mind. <laughs> Cuz I'm like this show was made for me. <laughs> uh next question, what is a local hero or indie toku project that is an absolute must watch? Tochi Younger 7, everyone should watch him, dear lord. Tochi Younger 7 is basically this amazing story uh you have this guy who wanted to do the superhero thing um, this is the real life story he wanted to ah. do the superhero thing uh because that was always his dream he wanted to be in like in a show or something but he had to take over the family business and at age 40 it hit him why not both so <laughs> he creates this hero who's essentially a love letter to like 1970s pension heroes he Ooh. transforms by slapping two things of karage on his shoulders <laughs> <laughs> and then he becomes Blazing Fox, uh, Tochi Younger 7. I love him. I wish he had the series readily available on YouTube. He had it on for like a limited run. You can get it all on DVD. There's also a movie that oh, came out. A movie. The movie looks so good. Like he, they matched color temperatures, so it looked like it came from the 1970s. Oh my God. I'll have to show you the trailer later. It's amazing. Please do. It, it was featured as part of the Year of Indies video for Vintage. I. I, I cannot talk about this show enough. I wish it had more love. And uh, he's a, he seems like a really cool dude. Final question. Oh, f***. Most important question. Uh... <laughs> <clears throat> Who is the best boy? Tell me your ultimate robot husbando. Who's top hunk? Oh, God. <laughs> Who's best boy? I'm going to... Okay. So who, who is metal husband? Okay, so if we have to think of best boy, are, am I limited to classic Tokusatsu or can I go over? I she didn't say so. You know what? If, if you know, fuck it. So um, this is where I'm, <laughs> this is where I'm swearing the most. So there's gonna be a lot of bleeps. Uh, best boy is Riku from Ultraman Jeed, even though he is a total moron and will spend your grocery money on getting a PS4. That's <laughs> he, he, <laughs> I remember watching uh, the Ultraman Rube movie, and there's the little sister of the main guys because it's two brothers who transform in that show. Mm -hmm. They're all, they're worried about her seeing like this boy who they've never met, and so they're they're taking him out. And I remember tweeting like, of all the boys that she had to go for, she picked the best one. <laughs> <So> <laughs> and then ultimate robot husband. I thought these were all one question. I thought this was who is the best hunky robot boy. I'm splitting this up because I don't have one be all end all answer for this. That's fair. It is your show. Okay. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Okay. Ultimate robot as Mondo. Um, it's going to be robot detective K probably. Cause I just, I want him to have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> cause, cause he's so sad and mopey all the time. I'm like, dude, dude, come Aww. here, come here, come here. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take you out for dinner. It's okay. <laughs> We're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. We're going to walk in the park and you're not going to angst about your giant robot mom in heaven. It's okay. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> We're going to watch Jonathan Ross, and you're going to be happy that he's dressing up like you for Japanorama. It'll be great. I was waiting for you to mention that. <laughs> so, uh, and then Lossy who, cosplays as, as robot detective. As for who's top hunk, um, I'm going to say any role played by Joji Nakata. Mm, word, yeah. Uh, with honorable mention going to any role with uh, Hikaru Midorikawa as the voice. Mm, yes. Mm. It would, I would pay money. To, to just, like, listen to him reading the phone book. I thought you were going to say something else. Like, okay, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. All right. And then to make it fair, uh, best girl is going to be Naomi Morinaga from Spielbahn is Helen. For robot wife, probably uh, Koron from Live Man <laughs> because I'm trash. And also she can moonwalk. So that's <laughs> that's an instant bonus. And then yeah, for top babe or whatever... Uh, I'm going to say Yuriko Hishimi Ultra 7. Mm. I'm exposing myself a little bit with this. <laughs> she, she's got like... We're, we're well past that. We're, I, know, we're, we're, I know we're well past exposure, but I'm just like, okay, look, it's, I'm sorry, she's gorgeous. Yeah, I'm, I'll never get married now. Uh, anyway, so <sighs> holy, holy hell, we did it. That is... We did it! <laughs> to celebrate a thousand subscribers, and I am... Oh my god, my voice is going to be gone. 
probably <laughs> tomorrow. I'm recording more stuff in a couple of hours, so. Oh, no. <laughs> no, you did way more talking than I did, so I should be good. I'll lose my voice later. All right, cool. Solidarity. Anyway. <laughs> Cara, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for thank you for having me on. I've really been enjoying your channel. I am learning a lot. Aww. Uh, I really, yeah. And I, you know, I'm not just on here because we have known each other for a million years. I actually am a fan of vintage henshin very much. <laughs> so it's that or I forced her to watch House again. But uh, where can people find mm. you online? And do you have anything you want to plug real quick? You can find me on Twitter at Ruby Cosmos. You can find me, uh, my blog at www.caradenison.com. Uh, those are the two best places to find me at present. I'm working on a few things, but the thing I'm really working on right now is with my friend Ginger Hosley. We're doing kind of a chill podcast where we watch each other's favorite TV shows during lockdown and beyond. Uh, it's called the Sin and Violence Podcast, and we're actually, that's what we're recording in a minute, where we watch Life on Mars and Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. I think that wouldn't be a, a uh, comparable mix, but then you find out no. Surprisingly. <laughs> yeah. They, they surprisingly have a handful of things in common. Uh, funnily enough, she's the one who's showing me brotherhood. Uh, <laughs> that's the big sin is I haven't seen Full Metal Alchemist yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm halfway through now and I'm loving it. But oh, yeah, good. that is the thing we're working on. If you just go to my Twitter account, I post a new episode whenever it goes up. Cool. So that's me at the moment. Yeah, and then, um, let's see, well, if I plug anything, it's just going to be a retread of anything that people will find on social media. But anyway, um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm going to collapse. But uh, thank you so much <laughs> for supporting this project. Thank you so much for uh, just all the kind words and everything. And uh, everyone at Patreon, thank you. You guys are amazing. And I, just, I, I don't, I'm running out of good words to say about you. I love you all. <laughs> um, so... From all of us here, uh, goodbye, so long, adieu, and oh, wait, wrong show. Um, Sa, nice to meet you all. There we go. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs>